Thanks for tuning in to our 2017 Spring Crop Insurance Update meeting. My name is Corey. I'm with KW Insurance, and I'm going to walk you through um, some things on crop rotations that we've learned on the farming side of our operation. A lot of insurance stuff specific to the pulses, because that's um, one thing that a lot of you guys might be growing peas and haven't done it in the past, or different types of peas that have specific rules on the insurance that we need to make sure we follow if you're going to get your coverage up to date on that. So. First off, you can go to our website to review any of this presentation information on the Crop Assurance Education Online tab. That's Our website's kwsunburst.com. You go on there and click on this Crop Assurance Education Online. In there, you'll find all the slides from this presentation and as well as some of our previous presentations. You can track the PLC prices at the FSA. Those change, get updated every month up till the 1st of June for what you're going to get for payment at the FSA this fall for the 2016 crop year disaster. Um, with the commodity price declines if you're in PLC. And also you can look and see if there's any LDP possible payments on crops that you might still have in the bin there for the 2016 crop year. If you click on that crop insurance education tab in there, there's a crop rotations quick reference sheet. On that sheet, you'll be able to look and see how long of a break you need between seeding smooth peas back to ground that had smooth peas on it before. Lentils, chickpeas, canola, that sort of stuff. So. Really easy to understand, quick reference sheet for how long of a break you need between these pulse crops or um, these are the broadleaf crops on the crop insurance side. What, what does our operation entail? Most of you guys know already, but we have an insurance office and a farm, a grass-fed beef operation that we're starting to use more in the farming part, which we'll get into in the crop rotation presentation. Uh, we do rent some equipment basically just a roller and a tractor anymore basically is what we have left there and then we sell egg chemicals for Ben Taylor Inc through a warehouse that is actually attached to our insurance office there so one of the questions we ask at our live grower meetings always is what you plan on growing for this following crop year um, the first question do you plan to grow peas lentils or chickpeas this is one of the biggest shifts in production in our area that we've had in a long long time Basically, five years ago, this answer may have been 10% on this crop. You'll see at our grower meeting, 64% of the producers are going to try some sort of pulse crop this year. So major shift from the direction we were just wheat and barley before to now throwing pulses in our rotations, mostly driven by low wheat and barley prices, right? plus the fact that these rotations work. So as far as the wheat goes, are you seeding wheat this year? This would have been more like 90% in the past. Now we're looking at about 58% is all of the grower seeding wheat. So basically the lowest wheat acres we've had in the county probably ever, I would think, as far as percentage of people growing it. Are you seeding barley this year? Same thing. Normally we'd be about 50%, I would guess, on this, and we're down to about 29% because there's not as many contracts available and the open market price is poor on that. And also uh, canola, that would have been maybe more like a 10% of our growers. And now you'll see at least the, the growers that attended our meeting, we're looking at about 36% of them that are going to try this. So the point of this being is that acreages are shifting a lot from wheat and barley to some of these alternative crops. And that's what we're going to cover most on this presentation here going forward. So first off, this looks at smooth peas in 2011. This is in Toole County. We had 5,000 acres at that point that was being grown in the county. You can see how quickly it ramped up into 2015. Now into 2017, we're going to be probably 50,000 plus acres at least of these crops. So in a five-year period, we went from 5,000 up to 35,000. That shows you as these acres ramp up that it's obviously working profitability-wise for people and also in that rotation. So first off, we're going to cover why we should rotate crops. Obviously, we've been big crop fallow people here for a long time because of mostly the thought of conserving moisture. Um, South Dakota State's done some excellent research on getting away from fallow first off and then using more high carbon crops in our rotations, which we'll get into. And then there's some benefits from soil health. Weed control is a big one where we have resistant kochia and fallow. And um, if you want, you can go on our website, go to that crop insurance education tab and look at Dwayne Beck's presentation under the crop insurance education link. And you can, if you watch that entire presentation, I think that's an hour or so that's really well spent of your time. This slide just shows, compared to using just weed on weed on weed in your rotation, how much more water efficient and nitrogen efficient it is to throw some pulses in there. So where we have P, wheat, P, your nitrogen use efficiency was 42 down here. It goes up to 52 by throwing the peas in there. So basically, 
you use for every pound of nitrogen you put down, you're about 20% more efficient at using it when you throw pulses in your rotation. Same thing with the water use efficiency. This is how much rain it takes for a bushel of wheat. If you get out of just the wheat, wheat, wheat rotations and you start throwing pulses in there, you end up using basically 30% less water for one bushel of wheat. If you look at it that way. Other advantages, obviously, breaking disease cycles. Doing grain on grain isn't good as far as um, diseases. Different herbicide mode of actions, that's one of the big things now with that Roundup resistant issue in the chem follow. Many of our producers, or almost all of our producers that are three-quarter crop, at least, and one-quarter fallow do not have the resistant kochia issues that the crop fallow, crop fallow guys do. And if you watch Wayne Beck's presentation, he'll explain more as to why that is. But so basically, the big thing to take from that Dwayne Beck presentation is that three out of four years should be high carbon crops. So what are high carbon crops? That's basically any grass crop that we would grow. So you'll see wheat straws at the top of this. Barley would be in that same category. Um, in our area, basically we're looking at winter wheat, spring wheat, or barley that we can grow and market here somewhat efficiently. So three out of four years should be winter wheat, spring wheat, or barley. And then one out of those four years should either be peas or fallow or um, canola, one of those lower residue crops. This is a big shift from what we were thinking. We were trying to shift towards never putting the same crop back on that same field year after year. If you watch Dwayne Beck's thing, I think you'll understand that they actually found it's best to stack crops. So do wheat on wheat, then switch to peas, then do barley, barley, than it is to try and just switch between wheat, then a pulse, and then barley and a pulse going forward. So to build soil organic matter in your rotation, it should consist of what percent high carbon crops? The answer on that is 75% or more, basically. So three quarters of your crop should be high carbon, one quarter should be something like a pea, fallow, or canola situation. At our live meeting, we reviewed Dwayne Beck's presentation. I want to skip that part, but you can watch that on our website if you want. But one of the big takes from that is if you look at these two rotations that they compared here at their university research station, this one would compare the most to what we're doing. So we have, or this one would, I'm sorry. So we have soybeans, corn, peas, and winter wheat. This would be a 50% carbon rotation. What we would be doing here, instead of the soybeans, is we'd put fallow in there. And instead of the corn, it's probably barley, let's say. So we're going, let's say, fallow, barley, peas, then winter wheat in our rotation, which would be pretty common. We never get our organic matter built up above about that 2% because we're not adding enough carbon back into the soil. So by just switching to a two out of three year carb, high carbon rotation here on 7.9 inches of rain, the year they do wheat there, they got a 60 bushel wheat yield because of the water holding capacity of the soil now versus 29. You look at this same comparison. This would be us, right? This is high carbon. 23 inches of rain, which I know is outside of what we probably would realize ever. 92 bushel versus 57. This realistically would be pretty close to what we'd have in growing season, six inches. 28 bushel winter wheat versus 56 because of soil health and water holding capacity, all because of just changing the mix of crops in the rotation. He's big on checking or trying to mimic nature and one of the things you'll say in that presentation if you watch it is that compare native range to what we're trying to do in our cropping systems. And on native range, we're probably 90% grasses and 10% forbs, sweet clover, that kind of stuff. So the more we can imitate the native range here, the better off we're going to be soil health-wise going forward. This is our current farm rotation. We were trying to just throw fallow and a pulse in between each one of the grass crops, <clears throat> which now if you look at it from the carbon standpoint, not very good, right? So what's wrong with our rotation? We've got a low carbon, high carbon, low carbon, high carbon. So two out of three, two out of four years, basically, we're not adding any organic matter to the soil. How would we switch this up to make it better? Well, now that I think we understand we're not afraid of stacking crops, we could put barley on barley because that's a pretty good crop rotation and then throw the peas in the middle of that to break the diseases. The other good thing with that is the first year we do barley, we might not do real great on the cheatgrass and the foxtail, but it's going to be under control because of our previous part of our rotation. The second year, we might getting start getting some foxtail and cheatgrass in there. 
we're building more carbon now. So that cheatgrass might have got a little worse at that point, and the foxtail barley certainly will. But when we throw the peas in there, we can control all the grasses. So now we've knocked back our foxtail barley. We've knocked back our, any kosher problems that we may have had in the barley, which we probably won't, but in fallow, that would be a big deal. <clears throat> Plus, the peas are going to add nitrogen for this next crop in there. What's going to happen if we just kept doing peas on peas? Obviously, disease. And then we'll start getting prickly lettuce and mustards in there because we can't control that in the peas very well. But then the next year, for most of you guys, this is probably going to make more sense for this to be winter wheat. We could throw winter wheat in there on the peas. That's a great rotation. That's a high carbon crop. Great for building soil. And then um, the next year we could stack wheat on wheat so we could put spring wheat in there. That'd be another high carbon crop. And then throw canola in there, which is a deep rooted crop. We only want to use canola like once every six years because it really breaks down some of the organic matter in the field, but it's really good at rooting down deep, pulling nitrogen back up that we can't access with these other crops and releasing it on top. So think of those brassica crops <clears throat> as crops that are basically mining the soil for what we lost and bringing it back up to the top. The other thing on canola is we can use Liberty Link, Roundup Ready, Clearfield. There's all sorts of different chemistries we can use in that to control some weeds that maybe we're getting a little bit out of control in this past stuff. And then we just roll right back into our rotation again. So now we have a one, two, three, four, four year break between the last time we were on barley. So the odds of having any barley disease problems are pretty slim. We're going to continue on with this rotation forward. We might mix some of these crops back and forth in there, but Basically, we're going to have a big break between the same crop back to the same crop. And it all sounds good to just quit following right off the bat, but we understand there's some challenges. One of the big ones is you have to work off recrop yields on your insurance. <clears throat>